that again and everyone at one time. Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be with you on what has been a beautiful few days. It's lovely to come with you on a sunny Sunday morning. And as we gather, just a few announcements before we begin our worship. We are um, hosting an appeal during the month of May for bicycles in Marini. This is a diocesan appeal because they, as a diocese, are partnered with the Diocese of Marini, but we are also partnered with Marini as a parish. So if you would like to donate anything towards an appeal for bicycles for clergy in the Diocese of Marini, then there's a retiring collection with, um, with baskets at the doors as you leave church this morning, and you can leave the donation into it. And thank you so much in advance for your generosity. Our summer fair is coming quickly, and we're praying for weather like it has been, so please do join us in praying for a sunny day on Saturday the 15th of June from 1 p.m. At this stage, we're beginning to collect for a few stalls with more things coming in the week before the feast, but if you're able to give anything towards the Lucky Dip or the Bottle Shop, the items on the screen there, then please leave them into church at any point, um, or leave them to the church office where there is a box where you can put them in. Also, if you're able to help by donating plants, they will be kept alive and tended to carefully in the meantime, but please do leave any plants to the church hall as well. And if you have any um, plant pots in sort of a small or medium size, then they will be greatly appreciated as well. And again, thank you so much for all your support and help in making the summer fair a great day. Our Sunday school celebration is on Saturday the 9th of June at 11.15 a.m. That's a really important day for our church family as we come together to give thanks for the past year of Sunday school, to give thanks for teachers and young people who have been part of it um, and to celebrate that together. So please do come and be part of that at 11.15. And after it, we'll have the long table, a barbecue after the service. So please do come along, invite friends, and the more the merrier. And again, we're praying for sunshine that day as well. On Sunday, the 2nd of June at 7 p.m., we have a special event for parents, carers, leaders, grandparents, anyone who would be interested. It's Parenting in a Digital World. It's an evening with Pair Northern Ireland, and as they give practical tips um, and offer wisdom on how to cope and navigate in a digital world. So please do come along and invite others. You know maybe other parents who don't normally come to church. This is a good evening to bring them along um, as they get some very practical wisdom. Our midweek prayer continues on Wednesday evenings up at 7.30 p.m. in Holy Trinity Side Chapel. We'd love to see you there. So come along to cultivate a habit of prayer by being still in God's presence in the middle of the week. And see what God does when his people show up together to pray in his name. We'd love to see you on Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. But now as we turn our hearts and minds to worship, shall we pause in prayer together? Heavenly Father, we do give thanks that we, your people, can come together in your name to worship you with thanksgiving, with praise. And so, Father, whatever has been on our hearts and minds this day and this week, we lay it at your feet now and invite your Spirit to come and to minister to us, to anoint us at a point of deepest need, to lift up our hearts to you so that this day we might be refreshed and renewed in our service to you. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand together as we sing our opening worship? Let's stand and worship God. Thank you. 
Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour Jesus taught us, so we pray, our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 4, and Olivia is going to come up to read it to us now. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent since in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I have slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gives human beings their mind? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? It is not I. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak. And we'll teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother, Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak, and we'll teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were in your mouth, and as if you were going to him. But take this staff in your hand, so you can perform the signs of it. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to sing our kids' song now, so if there's any kids in church who would like to come up to the top step and show the adult how it's done, come on up. We're singing, Our God is a Great Big God. If there's any young people in church who would like to come and help the kids lead the way with the actions, you can come and stand at the bottom of the steps. Um, and all the adults in the congregation can stand as well, because this is one that we know and love to do together. God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God, and He holds us in His hands. Oh, my God. 
over to the hall and kids can follow them for their own learning and activities. And we do pray for God's blessing upon them as they go. together. Our gracious God and Father, creator of all that is good, we thank you for the gift of life, for the wonder of the world in which you have placed us, and for all the blessings you so freely lavished upon us. Forgive us that too often we take your gift for granted and think so little of you, the giver. Help us to recognize your hand in the ordinary things of life and make us thankful for the gifts we have received. Help us to live in the power of the Spirit, keeping in step with Him, in the sure knowledge of your love and goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of love, we give thanks for your unfailing love for us, and for your great commandments, which call us to love you and to love our neighbor. Come by your Spirit to make us so aware of your love for us, and so stir in our hearts to increase our love for others. We pray for our neighbors in this community, for those struggling with finances, with relationships, with work, or with any kind of heavy burden. Be at work by your Spirit, we pray, bringing comfort and peace, softening hearts, and drawing people into your presence. We pray for our neighbors across this nation as we ask for your blessing upon those who govern and lead, remembering especially His Majesty the King, our Prime Minister, and all in Westminster and in local government. We pray for our neighbors across the world, remembering especially those who continue to be affected by war in Ukraine and in the Middle East, by weather extremes caused by climate change and by poverty caused by inequality in our world. Lord, bring comfort to those who mourn today. Bring healing to those who have been injured. Provide for those in need. And strengthen and sustain all who work to bring aid, to rebuild lives, or to make peace. Lord, in your mercy, Lord of the Church, we give thanks that you unite us together in one body through faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Pour out your Spirit afresh on your Church in these days, that we may be spurred on in preaching the good news of Jesus to all people. Keep us steadfast in the faith, firm in the truth, and bold in our proclamation of the Gospel. Bless our church family and bless our new rector, Willie and his family, Caroline, Anna, Alice, and Sam, as they prepare to move home. Give Willie your vision and be his guide as he prepares to come and lead us here, so that, united as one family, we might see much fruit for the sake of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, your last word to your disciples before you left this earth was that they should go and preach the gospel in all the world and to every nation. We praise you for all who since then have obeyed your command, and for those who brought the gospel to our own shores and to our own lives. Help us to be your witnesses today wherever you have placed us. Show us how to make the good news meaningful to our own generation and in our own community. And may its power be seen more clearly in our lives for the honor and praise of your name. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you know the sorrows of our hearts and the burdens we are carrying this day. Give us your comfort and your peace 
and help us to look to you and to trust you for all that lies ahead. Give us strength to face every new circumstance with courage, patience, and hope through faith in Jesus. And in the quietness of this place, we name our burdens and the burdens of those known to us before the Lord who loves and cares for us. Merciful Father, hear our prayers and answer us for our good and for your greater glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we have now prayed to God, let's stand together as we affirm our faith and trust in God. I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we remain standing as we sing our offertory song, My Jesus, My Saviour. Thank you. 
Father, we give thanks for your word, which you use to call us to yourself, to faith and to love, to live and to serve for your glory. So come now by your spirit, we pray, to open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts, so that we might respond to your call to us. In Jesus' name. Put your hands up if you have seen the Mission Impossible films, or at least one of them. So, in the Mission Impossible films, each of those films starts with a mission, some kind of phone call or message that self-destructs as soon as it's been listened to by the main character, a guy called Ethan Hunt. Those messages always outline a seemingly impossible mission and task, and always begin with the words, your mission you choose to accept it. If you've seen those films, you'll know that it's impossible as the mission might first seem. Those impossible missions for agents have some pretty decent training that see them do some pretty impossible things, and they have some decent gadgets to help them along the way. And spoiler alert, all of this usually means that by the end they can say, mission accomplished. This call to mission is what we are invited to through Scripture today. Unfortunately, I'm not inviting you into an impossible missions agent's course. I'm not going to give you any fancy gadgets or any special training, because today we read about an impossible mission made possible because it is given by God, the one through whom and with whom all things are possible. It doesn't take fancy gadgets. God doesn't use specially trained agents. Instead, he calls this ordinary man named Moses, who is slow to listen, who says he's not actually great at speaking, though his mission involves speaking to a king. But despite all of this, God is going to use Moses in a mighty way. As we continue this series and continue to learn from Moses' friendship with God, today we're focused on hearing, on trusting, and on responding to the God who calls us to live and work to his praise and glory. We're called to grow like Moses in our own friendship with God so that, like Moses, God can work in and through us for the sake of his kingdom. First, let's remind ourselves of some context. And if you do want to have your Bible open, we're in Exodus chapter 3, the end of 3, and the beginning of chapter 4. Last week we heard Moses encountered God on the far side of the wilderness where the voice of God called to him from within a burning bush. Moses, Moses, Moses has said, here I am, and now he's about to find out what that means. Their friendship has just begun, but the God who called to Moses by name knows him and has a task for him. If we flick back from chapter 4, chapter 3, verses 7 to 12, introduce this calling to Moses from God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land, out of that land into a good and spacious land a land flowing with milk and honey. If you have your Bible open, you'll notice that I'm missing out a lot of long names. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now I go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses has heard God's call. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Moses has heard God's call, but he isn't at all sure that he's the right man for this job. And it's interesting that at this point in the Exodus narrative, God doesn't tell Moses why he's qualified, what makes him the right man for this seemingly impossible mission. Because there are ways to which Moses is perfectly placed to fulfill this calling. Moses lives among Egyptians, so he has the benefit of cross-cultural knowledge. 
Yes, he did have that small fur of a criminal record hanging over him, but the timing was perfect. A new king is on the throne in Egypt. Around 40 years have passed since Moses committed that crime. It's almost like the statute of limitations has passed. And Moses has a heart for his people. The reason he fled Egypt in the first place was because at heart he was fighting against the poor treatment, the injustice faced by the Israelites. And our God is inviting Moses to see justice done. Slaves freed and God's people restored and led into a home of their own where they could freely worship the God who saves. But this is not what God tells Moses. God does not remind Moses of his justice-led motivations, or he doesn't tell Moses of these qualifications, because according to Scripture, Moses' motivation is to be the call of God alone. Moses' qualification for this calling is one important truth alone. God will be with him. That should be enough, but if we read the rest of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4, we will only hear objections from Moses. He doesn't know God's name. What if the Egyptians don't listen to him or believe what he has to say? What then? We heard in verse 10, Moses is not eloquent. He's slow of speech and tongue. He's not the man God is looking for. Send someone else, Moses says in verse 13. Moses has encountered in a burning bush in the middle of nowhere this holy and perfect God. He has now heard God calling him, giving him a specific task to do. But because of his own imperfections, Moses doesn't, doesn't yet trust the God who has called him. And this is the point. When Moses is so unsure about what will happen or what to do next, this is the point at which Moses' friendship with God begins to deepen. To each one of his objections, God has an answer. Moses doesn't know his name. God says, I am. Moses doesn't think the Egyptians will listen to him. God promises to stretch out his hand and perform signs that will compel Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. Moses doesn't think he has authority. He doesn't think people will believe him. Well, God promises to give Moses the ability to perform signs so that as he speaks, people will believe. Moses doesn't think he is the skill. He's not a public speaker. So God sends him Aaron to be his companion. The God he calls is trustworthy. He can be known by name. He promises his presence and his power. He will be with those he calls. We can see God's faithfulness to his promises and learn that he is trustworthy if we read through the rest of Exodus. With signs and with wonders, God will free his people from slavery in Egypt. And he will be with Moses every step of the way. We can trust the God who calls. Because God always calls according to his purposes. He is always faithful to his promises and God's word will never fail. This is why God can say that the proof of the call is the sign of its success and will be the turning of hearts to worship him, the one who is called and who is faithful. It's just like Paul would later write to the Thessalonians, the God who calls you is faithful and he will do. God will accomplish the task he calls us to. This complete trustworthiness of God is a firm foundation for friendship with God. And our friendship with God will, like Moses, deepen as we hear and trust the God who calls us. He calls us to encounter him in the everyday and the ordinary as well as the extraordinary. He calls us to enjoy a relationship with him, to set aside time to spend with him. And he calls us to go in obedience to the call he has over each of our lives. We see that Moses is called here by God to fulfill a very specific task at a very specific time. But all of God's people are called. God tells Moses that he is the one who has created Moses. He has given him speech. He has made him able to speak. He reminds Moses that this is God the Creator. Each of us, we are people made in God's image, and so we are called. 
to fulfill the original task spoken to the first humans, to care for God's creation, to be good stewards of the resources entrusted to us. We are called to shape our lives in accordance with God's commandments because that is the good and life-giving way. Jesus helpfully summed them up for us. Love God and love your neighbor. That is a call to each one of us. And just as Jesus himself once called people to follow him, so we are called to follow Jesus, to come after him in faith, to love him, to live like him, to do the things that he did. We are called in the gospel of Jesus Christ out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. And in the light of this eternal kingdom, we are each called to use our individual gifts and abilities to God's glory. It's so easy for us to make the mistake of thinking that when we talk about calling or when we talk about vocation, we are speaking only of ordained ministry or some other full-time ministry. But C.S. Lewis reminds us that the work of Beethoven and the work of a cleaner and every other task and shape and form of work in between and besides, these are spiritual callings, Lewis says, on precisely the same condition. That of being offered to God, of being done humbly as to the Lord. The things we might think of as everyday and ordinary the things we do between nine to five, the things we do with our family and our friends, the way in which we look after our home and those entrusted to us. All of these become spiritual calling, vocations from God to the extent that we choose to do them for his glory. This use of calling and vocation, it means that everything we do has a potential holiness to it. It is of value in this way in the kingdom of God. God sees what we do in quiet. God sees when we work with integrity. God sees when we serve others, even in ways that are unseen by others. God sees the workers who feel invisible. He sees the parents who are making sacrifices for their children. God sees our whole heartedness. He loves our faithfulness especially when we do what we do as if we were doing it for him. Working in this way honors God. Working in this way even or maybe especially when it doesn't lead to promotions, to bonuses, to worldly success. Working in this way brings glory to God. Working in this way demonstrates our trust that our God is with us. Working in this way reflects the truth that God has called each of us to work for Him. And work for the Lord always has eternal value. God has given you gifts, abilities, and relationships. God has positioned you in certain places and opened to you certain opportunities. So whether you're a parent, a grandparent, a friend, a customer, a business person, a doctor, an accountant, a teacher, an office worker, a member of a sports team, whether you are a member of this church family, wherever you find yourself and whatever you do, God is calling you to the work of his kingdom. This is the invitation to us from scripture today to think about the ways in which God, our friend, is calling us to serve to use our gifts to his glory, to work with integrity for his glory. What would it look like for you to seek first God's kingdom, to pursue the things of God's kingdom, to make way for God's kingdom to break in through your daily life and work? This will look different for each of us, but it is what God is calling us to do. We learn to listen to his call by attending to his word by forming good relationships with people who help us to discern God's voice, who pray with us, who encourage us to take a step after step of faith. We learn to trust God's call by reminding ourselves that he has always been faithful to his promises. And we learn from the example of Moses, who knew himself to be called but felt himself to be inadequate. But Moses learned, and we can too, that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to go alone, but the God who calls is faithful. He goes with us. He empowers us and he equips us by his spirit. He raises up others to accompany us. And he will accomplish his purposes in us 
and through us to the glory of his name and for the advancement of his kingdom. So as we finish today, we're going to watch a video made for Vocation Sunday. It reflects on the call to ordination, yes, but also it uses a song which gives us space for reflection on the different ways that God will work in and through and use each of us for his kingdom. So we pray, Lord, during these next few minutes, speak clearly to us and help us, your servants, listen. In Jesus' name. Sunday, an opportunity to consider what God has called us to. Perhaps God has been speaking to you about your role in building his kingdom for some time now. Or if you watch this short video, God may speak to you about his own ministry. He speaks to your ministry. They may direct you to our exploring ministry group, which meets three times each year. Or perhaps they'll give you an opportunity to serve right where you are. This is gonna take the whole of my life. This is gonna take my every breath. But I know it's true. It's one thing to feel in what you called me to. This is gonna take the whole. Every one of us has a calling on our lives. We're all called to love God and love others. And as we step into that calling, God sometimes shows us new ways that we can serve and lead. For me, that looks like a calling from business and industry into ordination. Callings aren't always comfortable. They require courage. But we worship a God who tells us to be strong and courageous. And we worship a God who is always good. woman, the call to ordination training was unexpected and followed a series of opportunities to follow and serve God as a missionary in Uganda, as a diocesan leader, and uh, finally leading Christ Church Primacy. God met my self-doubts through the words of the Annunciation passage in Luke 1. Mary was given an impossible task, and all God needed was her yes. And the power of the Holy Spirit.
calling toward ODM ministry is something that has been rising up within me over the last number of years. I've been working in local churches in different ministry roles, but once I started exploring this idea of ordination, uh, God really affirmed in me that this was the path that he wanted me to take. Uh, God used other people speaking into my life, as well as time with himself, to really affirm in me this calling. Shall we respond to God in worship as we sing our final song, Hear the Call of the Kingdom. Let's stand and worship God.
be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.